and welcome to the Spectrum Show. Coming up, we get all the news and top selling games from January 1989. I check out the unreleased Parker ROMs. I play some games and take a trip to Type In Corner. But first, here's the news. Codemasters are not happy at the moment. It seems alternative software have upset them, at least according to Codemasters. They say that Alternative's budget release, Formula One Grand Prix, itself an old re-release of a CRL game, has artwork that plagiarises one of Codemasters' games, namely Grand Prix Simulator. Codemasters claim that their best-selling game, selling over 200,000 units, is far better, saying that the Alternative game is just a management simulation. They also say they will serve a writ on the company, forcing them to change the artwork. Racing games will all have similar covers. What else would a company put on them? It's a game about racing cars, after all. Is this the case of Codemasters wanting to get their game into the public eye again? Who knows? The transfer of comic characters from screen and book to computer continues. Last month brought us Postman Pat. And if things couldn't get any worse, this month we see Garfield. The Edge have grabbed the license for this cute cat to appear on your Spectrum sometime in February. And if that's not enough, The Edge will also be bringing us Peanuts and Snoopy. Something to look forward to then. And there's more license deals. If you watch television on Saturday morning, you will no doubt be familiar with Get Fresh and the green alien named Gilbert. Well, guess what? Yes, he's coming to your Spectrum too. And this time it's via Again Again software. Not enough computer shops on your high street? Well, this is about to change. Boots, one of the largest game retailers on the high street, has just bought the rival chemist Underwoods. That means all Underwood stores will become Boots, and they'll be stocking your favourite computer games. The Sam Coupe is arriving soon, so say the manufacturers Miles Gordon Technology. The new machine, with impressive graphics, sound and a built-in disk drive, and more memory, but most importantly a Spectrum emulation mode, will be available around April, and have the asking price of £149. For the machine you get, that's an incredible price, and Miles Gordon Technologies are hoping their new machine will fly off the shelves to eager Spectrum owners, looking to upgrade but keep their existing games. And that was the news, now on to the top selling games. At number 5 is Daily Thompson's Olympic Challenge from Ocean. Number 4 is Football Manager 2 from Addictive Games. At number 3 is Last Ninja 2 from System 3. At number 2 is Operation Wolf from Ocean. And at number 1 is Double Dragon from Melbourne House. And that was the news and top selling games from January 1989. In October 1983, Sinclair announced a new interface for the Spectrum, the Interface 2. This add-on would allow the use of a new format of storage, the ROM cartridge. The unit was cheap, and I covered this back in episode 21. The initial set of ROMs released consisted of just three titles, Planetoids, Backgammon and Space Raiders. Chess was released shortly after, and in December of the same year, the other six arrived, those being Hungry Horace, Horace and the Spiders, Jetpack, Psst, Transam and Cookie. The format was expensive to manufacture, and games appearing on the small cartridges cost around £15, which was more than the cost of the equivalent tape version. Also, because of how the unit worked, games were limited to just 16k. It's not surprising then that most software houses were cautious, and not a single one released titles for it. In April 1984 though, Parker announced that they would be releasing some of their games for the Sinclair's ROM system the first independent publisher to do so. They were concerned with piracy and hoped releasing on cartridge would help, but they also said they were going to expand the internal ROM from 9 to 16k, hopefully offering up more space for games. They expected the titles to be ready in June or July, however this changed to October a few months later. Things didn't go to plan. 
the Interface 2 didn't really attract any interest from publishers, and despite putting resources into games, Parker announced its withdrawal from the UK games market in November 1984. That was just seven months after their initial plans to produce software for the system. This, I think, was the final nail in the coffin for Interface 2. But somehow, the games Parker had been working on found their way out, and they give us a glimpse of what might have been. Two games did get released on cassette afterwards, those being Panama Joe, aka Montezuma's Revenge, a favourite amongst Atari owners, and Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle, again another conversion from the Atari. The other titles, although not complete and sometimes buggy, show just how far Parker had got before pulling the plug. To use them on a real spectrum, I use my smart card, which allows ROM images to be written to fixed banks in the card and then loaded via a menu. And for the footage I use Spectaculator. Let's take a look then. The first one is Popeye. This is a conversion of the arcade game released by Nintendo in 1983. The arcade game has three main screens, seeing Popeye collecting items dropped by olive oil. The ROM version, well, yes. I can see they were making progress, but the graphics are a bit bland. There's no sound either, but things do move smoothly enough. It is though a nightmare to control. From the track mode it looks like all three screens are included, but for me this is just not playable. We all know Qbert, that fun, bouncy pyramid game released in the arcades in 1982 by Gotilab. There are many versions of this for the Spectrum, and the ROM version could have been pretty good. This prototype though is buggy and prone to crashing. This seems much more advanced than the Popeye game. We have nice gameplay and sound, the arcade features have been incorporated, and it's quite fun to play. The bouncy snake chases you around, and the discs take Qbert back to the top of the pyramid. Yes, this is a nice game, or could have been if it was ever released. I don't know why they didn't put the finished version out on tape. At least it would have made some money. Gyrus, one of my favourite arcade games, released by Konami in 1983. I always try and grab a game of this at retro events. There isn't really a good version of this on the Spectrum, so hopes were high for the Parker conversion. I didn't hold out much hope, but once the tune starts and the game plays, I found it to be really good. I love this. Why didn't they release this on tape? The playability is there, and yes, the graphics are not as colourful as the arcade, and there's music missing while you play, but in general it's a great game. They've got this one right, the movement, the attack patterns, all excellent. I spent quite a while playing this when I should have been looking at the others. Anyway, let's move on. Star Wars the Arcade Game, another classic. This one released in 1983 by Atari in the arcades and using their vector system to depict the now famous battle scenes. There are a few different versions of this on the Spectrum, some of them quite good. This one has the music at the beginning and it certainly looks like the start screen of the arcade too. Yes, it all seems very familiar. The sounds are a bit poor and the ship doesn't bob around like the arcade and obviously there aren't any voices. The trench scene has nothing to dodge in the first pass, and blowing up the Death Star was quite easy. The second run takes you onto the surface and we get turrets to shoot. And once in the trench, there are things to dodge as well. This is also a good game. It's nice to play and very rewarding. Again, why wasn't this put out on tape afterwards?
Next we have another Star Wars game, Return of the Jedi Death Star Battle. What the hell is this? I think that's the Millennium Falcon. And you have to fly around shooting things? At the same time dodging the Death Star shooting you. Okay. The graphics are poor. The gameplay is, well, rubbish. And sound is a bit dull. This game was released on the Atari 2600, and the sound was miles better on that system. I just can't see any gameplay here. Time to move on. Oh dear, things are getting worse. Locomotion. An odd game with two options, arcade and adventure. Let's try arcade first. Okay, you drive your train around. And then you fall off the track at the end. Hmm. No matter what I pressed, the same thing keeps happening. You can't change direction or anything. You can't win this game, at least I couldn't find a way to. You just crash all the time. No matter what speed I did or keys I pressed, the train just falls off the tracks. Let's try adventure mode. Okay then. So I can go backwards and pick up my cargo. And then chug along the tracks smoothly. Oh look, there's a man falling off his horse. I think that's the best part of the whole game for me. And then we reach the same point again. And we come off the tracks. This is so dull. I think we need to move on quickly. And finally, Montezuma's Revenge. Here we have the classic Atari game, ported across to the Spectrum, and having recently played the cassette version, this is interesting. The recovered ROM files have two different versions, and I tried both of them. There are some differences on the few screens that I visited. For this particular review, I'm going to call ROM 1 the release version and ROM 2 the early version, for reasons I'll get onto. So the early version introduces the character as Pedro, which has been taken off the release version both on tape and this ROM. The first screen on the early version has a different layout. This one makes it difficult to jump back, and they change this for the release version. Strangely though, this layout in the early version matches many of the others including the Atari 800 and ColecoVision versions. This screen and the conveyor belts move differently on different versions. The early versions make jumping almost impossible at times, but luckily the release version and the tape version made subtle changes to make the screen easier. And that sound effect on the early version is terrible. At least they got it right later on. From what I've played through, which is quite a lot of the game, I think the release version, labelled ROM 1, is the one that they put out on tape. Well, an interesting rummage through gaming history there. A mixed bunch. Some terrible games. Yes, I'm looking at you, Locomotion. But some great ones too. Star Wars and Gyrus being the standout ones for me. It was really sad that they never released them, if not on cartridge, at least on tape. And I'm sure they would have at least got some of their money back for the resources they put into them. This is Space Crusade from Gremlin Graphics, released in 1992. Space Crusade is not a game I own. The price is just too high, but I'm reviewing it here because it kind of wriggled its way under my skin and not in a good way. I was almost addicted and then came a revelation, but more on that later. The game is a computerised version of the board game and sees you controlling a group of space marines in various missions. It's a turn-based strategy game, so it claims, and I know a lot of people like this game, so I'll try to be as kind as I can. The first mission, according to the instructions, has been made as easy as possible to ease you into the game. There are no weapons selection, you can just jump straight in and play. Each marine is chosen in turn, and you then have several options that can be selected from the panel at the bottom. You can move, fire at a target, go into hand-to-hand -hand combat, open doors, issue orders in later levels, and do scans. Your first option is always going to be move, as there is nothing else to do at this point. Each marine moves, and according to the weapon they are carrying, they have limited movement. Light weapons, for example, mean your marine can move a long distance. However, 
weapons such as heavy cannons give limited distance. There are a variety of weapons, and each marine has a different one. There's a small bolter, and a bolt pistol. These are light, inflicting small amounts of damage, but letting the marine move a long way. There's an assault cannon that can fire at multiple targets. There's a missile launcher that can affect multiple squares and hit multiple targets. There's a plasma gun that can destroy everything in a straight line. And then there is a power sword and power glove, and these are only available to the commander. And the commander has excellent hand-to-hand -hand skills, and also has six lives, with all the other marines having just one. The whole mission has a time limit too, and this is displayed each time you let the computer take its turn. Right, let's get on to the game. As you've been watching, you move your marines around one by one. Once each marine has moved or attacked, it's the computer's turn to do something. Based on a random dice roll, there are many things that can be thrown at you, and this is a major problem, but more on that later. As you move your marines around, you can open doors and scan, although scanning does alert aliens to your presence. As you move into rooms, anything in them becomes visible. I'm playing here using mouse emulation, but you can also use a keyboard or a joystick. You navigate through the map looking for the Dreadnought, and eventually you will come across other enemies before you get to him. When you meet the enemies, there are various types, each taking a different amount of damage to kill. There are small green Gretchens, and these can be usually taken out by bolters or hand-to-hand -hand combat. Then there are Orcs, spelt with a K, and these need a bit more firepower. Then comes the Chaos Marines, and these need the big weapons to get rid of. On the first mission there's also an android, and of course the main target, the large dreadnought that looks like an ED-209 from Robocop. Some corridors are blocked with debris, and this can be removed by firing at them or hand-to-hand -hand combat. The map shows the floor plan and your team, along with any identified enemies. Enemies can only be seen if uh, you can see them, so for example you can only see what's in a room when you go into it, or scan it. Now on to the combat. Small weapons have a single dice roll, a random number, and this gives an attack value, a random attack value. And the enemy has a dice roll, a random number, giving that target a defence number, a random defence number. Large arms get an additional dice with another random number. The values are compared and the outcome played out. I had a commander, highly skilled in hand-to-hand -hand combat, with a power glove and power sword, roll zero, and a weak enemy rolled a two take in one of his lives, and if that wasn't annoying, it gets worse. When it's the computer's turn, it can throw a shed load of things at you, all at random. In one instance, I was halfway back, having killed the Dreadnought, with three marines alive, and out of nowhere, a booby trap. Got a high random number, and took out the entire team. Absolutely nothing I could do. And another time, I was on my way back with two marines left, and suddenly, when it was the computer's turn, two soul seekers appeared got a high random number, and killed them both. Excellent. And here lies the problem for me. I could not see the strategy element here. How can you have strategy when the whole game revolves around random numbers? It doesn't matter how you position your marines, how cautious you are, or where weapon types are placed in the formation. If a booby trap or soul seekers suddenly appear and get a high random number, it can take out three or four members of your team. So where's the strategy in that? OK, let's take a little step back. The graphics are nice, and can be swapped into a 3D view, and this view is also used to show the outcomes of combat. Sound is minimal but good, with footsteps, weapons, fire and explosions. Control is good too, although the scroll arrows on the side of the screen are sometimes difficult to hit, and I sent a marine to the wrong place several times by misclicking. I found it much easier to play with a mouse, and the hacked version of the game, which allows a Kempston mouse, can be downloaded from the Velisoft website. I played this game so many times. I also tried the Amiga version, and it's the same, and it destroyed my team unfairly time after time, all because of random numbers. Why isn't there a model where, when you kill something, you get experience and build up your team? Why aren't there any weapons upgrades? Maybe there are in later levels, I don't know, I just couldn't get there because of random numbers. I was getting addicted to this game. I had to complete the first level. But then, the realisation. If I did finish it, it was because of random numbers, and not my skill or any kind of strategy. When recording this video for the first time, I managed to complete the first level. But by this point, the excitement had gone. I knew at any time I could get killed by a random booby trap. And it was just a case of rolling the dice, seeing the number, shrugging and continuing. 
I was hooked on this game, I really was. I played it again and again over a period of about 14 days, sometimes four or five attempts per day. But I always felt that although the game looked nice and had a good story wrapped around it, it was just a random number generator. And this dictated the game, it dictated the outcome, and no matter how you approached it, if the random numbers were against you, you'd lose. The only strategy I could see was standing close to a door and using it to crush enemies, but that's hardly a master plan, is it? Even trying that can go wrong too, because the computer can throw a booby trap at you, and because you've got two members of your team there, you can take them out with a random number. And now I know a lot of people love this game, and in a way I can see why I really can, but for me, the sheer randomness takes away the gameplay completely. It's a bit of a shame, really. This is Olympiad 86, released by Atlantis Software in 1984. As you can probably tell, it's one of those track and field games, but this one has some interesting events and a different control method. There are five events, weightlifting, canoeing, 200 meter sprint, shooting and discus. Each have their own control method, so let's get straight in. This is the weightlifting event, and there's a small dial at the top of the screen, and as the arrow spins round inside it, you just have to press the Q key when it's pointing to the marker. And with a bit of luck, this should be easy to manage, and you get a full 80 points. The screens are fairly sparse, and it all happens in silence, unless you complete all lifts, and then you get a helicopter flying past. At the end of each event, you'll get your total points, which all add up and decide whether you get a medal or not. On to the next event and canoeing, and here you use the O and P keys to guide your canoe. At first I tried to follow the route, but it isn't a route, you just have to avoid hitting those rocks. And if you look very closely you'll notice that the canoe isn't moving, it's just the rocks that are randomly floating up the screen. This can be tricky because the collision detection is very tight. All again done in silence. The graphics though are large, with a little bit of animation, and this really is just a glorified Horace Goes Skiing, or even a cut down version, depending on your opinion. The next event took me a while to get right. Using the same spinning gauge control, you have to maintain a high speed to qualify. First, the control is not accurate. Hitting the marker does nothing to the speed. You have to hit the key just before it reaches the marker. And once you're at full speed, you still have to keep hitting that key. Not really sure why, because your speed stays the same. But if you hit full speed and then stop hitting the key, you fail. The runner is drawn OK, I suppose, and has decent animation. But again, all in silence, apart from the helicopter at the end, if you do well. Next we have the hardest event, at least in my opinion, shooting. Here you get to control a crosshair, but it's almost impossible to hit these things. I tried several tactics, like staying in the middle or staying at the top of the screen, but because they're random, it's very hard to hit the required amount. And in fact, I never got it. On to the last event then, and the discus. This uses the spinning gauge, but two of them. One is for the power, and once you hit the key to get that right, you then have to press the key to get the other one right, which is the angle. This is usually easy enough to get right. And that's the game. If you did well enough, you might get a medal. But I never managed it, because of the shooting game. It's a bit below average, really. But I do like the way they've moved away from the traditional button mashing games, like Daily Thompson but it's not one to come back to. This is Bobby Carrot, released in 2018 by a group of very talented people who you can see on screen now. It's a simple top-down puzzle game that oozes charm and professionalism. The aim is simple, collect all your carrots, and that's it. However, you have to follow a certain route.
You can move back over the holes you create by pulling up the carrots, but you have to avoid the traps that trigger when you walk over them, and this means you cannot go back once you trigger them. Each level gets progressively harder, so it keeps the brain working hard. The game has great graphics, animation and sound, as you can see and hear, and the music is very good and really suits the game. It's really easy to play too, so you can jump straight in and start enjoying the early levels, but things soon get tricky as you progress further. A really well put together game then, that's highly recommended. This is Star Warrior, by Vision Software, released in 1983. So the story goes, your spaceship is in constant need of energy crystals to keep it going through the vastness of space. To get these crystals you have to go through various stages. First there are swooping aliens, all dropping bombs. This is a standard left-right shoot 'em up and reminds me very much of Imagine's Arcadia. Once you clear these, which is just a matter of positioning your ship in the right place as they appear at the top of the screen, the game moves to the next level. Here you have to dodge meteors and to try and get to the bottom of the screen. You can use left, right and thrust here, but don't use the fire key because that just ends the game, which is a bit bizarre. When you get to the bottom of the screen, if you can, you are then thrown into a maze game with what the inlay describes as a psychotic cyborg. Here you have to get the crystals and avoid being killed, and again pressing the fire key quits which is very annoying. Because the cyborg is always homing in on you, you have to keep dodging left and right and then make a break for it to try and get to the bottom and back up again before it manages to get to you. If you do manage to get the crystal and back to your ship, you have to fly back past the asteroids and it takes you back to stage 1 with a different set of aliens. Rinse and repeat. The graphics are nice for a small game, they're smooth and responsive, and the sound is adequate I think. The main problem though is this key issue, you should never remap a key to something completely different. A competent game then for 16k, just avoid pressing the fire key if you can in those last two stages, and that last stage is harder than you think it would be. Type in Connor is back for a special. In episode 58 I covered the relatively unknown magazine Games Computing, and during that review I mentioned that there were many games listings in there that were still not available, so I set about typing one out. The game is called Docked in Space, and was found in the June 1984 issue of the magazine. There is no mention of the author though, so I am unable to credit them. After a few hours of typing away, it was time to run the game. And, amazingly, apart from a spelling mistake, it ran first time. Quite unusual for a type-in. The game has two sections. First you guide your ship to the landing pod at the bottom of the screen, avoiding the meteors. And then when that's complete, you guide them back up avoiding the other things that are placed there to destroy you. You have a limited amount of fuel too, so you have to be careful. It's really a simple version of Lunar Lander of course, but not bad for a typing. The collision detection is a bit off sometimes, but not too much to detract from it. The game is controlled using the cursor keys, but if you don't like them you can easily change them in the listing, if you have a bit of basic knowledge. This is probably the first time it's been seen in over 30 years, and it will be available to download from my website soon.